Our text this morning is from the Gospel of Luke. We're going to take a break from Acts, which was also written by Luke, and go back to his first book um, for the next uh, few weeks of Advent. So this morning it's Luke 1, verses 5 to 25. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well along in years. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord." Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. From the Gospel of Luke, this is the word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, uh, rather, as I've said, rather than take up the Acts of the Apostles for the next few weeks, we're going to leave our study to focus on Christ's entrance into the world at Bethlehem. Over the course of Advent, Christmas Eve, and the Sunday after Christmas, we're going to look at the first coming of Christ, and we're going to do so by examining songs of the season. There are five Christmas songs recorded for us in the Gospel of Luke. The song of Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, comes first on the occasion of her visit to her cousin Mary, who at the time was carrying the Christ child. Next comes Mary's song, the Magnificat, which begins, My soul doth magnify the Lord. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, gives us a song called the Benedictus, after his son is born the angels give us the fourth song when they sing to the shepherds, Glory to God in the highest. And the fifth and final song is the song of Simeon, the old man who had been promised by the Spirit that he would see the Messiah before he died. But today, before we get to the songs, we'll look at some background. In the Old Testament, the birth of Christ with its attendant details is foretold in many places at many times by many inspired writers. In the book of Numbers, God puts these blessed words concerning Christ in the mouth of a pagan prophet named Balaam. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. If you turn to a righteous prophet, Isaiah, you'll hear a wonderful promise in his 40th chapter. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. If you turn to the last page 
of the Old Testament, you'll find the same promise expressed in a different way by Malachi. Malachi, with the Spirit of the Lord upon him, proclaims the word of God, saying, But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. And then he says this, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. That word of prophecy from Malachi was followed by 400 years of silence. Through all those long years, there was no further word of prophecy, not even one sign from God, just silence. But that did not mean that God had forgotten his people or his promises made through Malachi, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so many others down through the centuries. Our God is faithful and true, and if to our way of thinking his answers seem a long time coming, we need to remember that a thousand years in his sight are like a day that's just gone by or like a watch in the night, as it's put in Psalm 90. Well, as we come to our Advent study, we're going to discover how the silence was broken. So, beginning at verse 5 of the Gospel of Luke, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. Elizabeth and Zechariah were recipients of God's grace in plentiful measure, so much, in fact, that they were upright in the sight of God and observed all the Lord's commandments. That doesn't mean that they were people of sinless perfection and full sanctification. It means that the Holy Ghost had planted true faith in their hearts and that as faithful believers, they hungered and thirsted after righteousness. They lived before the Lord with a clean conscience. In God's sight, they were beautiful people. Zechariah was an ordinary country priest, one of about 18,000 in the land at the time. The priests were divided into 24 divisions, with each division having about 750 priests. Each division served <clears throat> at the temple for two one-week periods each year, and each day 56 priests from the serving division were chosen by lot to participate in the many duties that surrounded morning and evening sacrifices. Elizabeth was also of priestly descent. She had the same name as Aaron, the high priest's wife. In fact, many priest's wives were named Elizabeth. While the meaning of that name is a matter of dispute, I always thought it meant God's oath, Elisaba, but that's how I interpret it. But scholars who deal with this sort of thing all agree that the name points to the faithfulness and promise-keeping nature of God. It's also a Ramsey name, eh, Elizabeth? Hayes, Janet Elizabeth Ramsey, Jean Elizabeth Kidd, it's all, anyway. Scottish people like it too, not just the Jews. Elizabeth and Zechariah were a blessed couple, but there was one cause of deep sorrow in their lives. Elizabeth was barren. She could have no children, and at this point, with her being well along in years, her youth gone, it seemed that she never would. Now, we need to understand what this meant for the Jews of that day. Barrenness was thought to be a judgment from God, and sin was assumed to be its cause. It was not thought a medical problem, but a moral one. And so with barrenness came disgrace. There are a number of similar situations recorded in Scripture. Think of the lengths that Sarah went to trying to secure a son for her husband Abraham. She sent her maidservant Hagar into him. Remember Rachel, Jacob's wife. She said to her husband, give me children or I'll die. Hannah, who would become the mother of Samuel, wept much in bitterness of soul when her dreams of bearing a child were long delayed. And even though her husband said, don't I mean more to you than ten sons, she would still not be comforted. That was the situation with Elizabeth and Zechariah, but things were about to change. Here's the lesson. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. So Zechariah was chosen by lot to burn incense in the holy place. So let's have a quick tour of the temple grounds, moving from the outside to the inside, so you can see it in your mind's eye. And remember, as you move deeper and deeper into the heart of the temple, 
you're moving into holier and holier ground. So first, the temple was massive and glorious. It was some 15 stories high. The historian Josephus described it in this words, it wanted nothing that could astound either mind or eye. For being covered on all sides with massive plates of gold, the sun was no sooner up than it radiated so fiery a flash that persons straining to look at it were compelled to avert their eyes as from the solar rays. To approaching strangers, it appeared from a distance like a snow-clad mountain, for all that was not overlaid with gold was of purest white. There were a series of outdoor courts or courtyards that made up the temple grounds. In the first one, the Gentiles could enter. The next one was reserved for Jews. Gentiles would enter on pain of death. The one after that was reserved for the priests. And after going through the outer courts, you'd come to a giant door that opened to a vestibule. On the far side of the vestibule was the holy place, and at the far end of the holy place was the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, the inner sanctum where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. The holy of holies was so sacred that only the high priest could enter, and that only once a year on the Day of Atonement. It's hard to explain what a great honor for Zechariah the offering of incense was. Let's just say it was the highlight of his princely career, priestly career. He'd reached the summit. Burning incense in the holy place was an honor that many a priest never had the opportunity to receive in his whole career. And it was a service of such importance, a priest was only allowed to render it once in his lifetime. Kent Hughes describes the scene this way in his commentary. Zechariah was serving God with his cohorts in the heart of the gleaming temple, in the court of the priests, where the sacrifice was to be made. Outside, in the court of Israel, faithful worshipers were praying. Then came the moment to step into the holy place. Before him rose the richly embroidered curtain of the Holy of Holies, resplendent with cherubim woven in scarlet, blue, purple, and gold. To his left was the table of showbread. Directly in front of him was the horned golden altar of incense. To his right stood the golden candlestick. Zechariah purified the altar and waited joyously for the signal to offer incense, so that, as it were, the sacrifices went up to God, wrapped in the sweet incense of prayer. And then it happened. Four hundred years of silence was broken. The angel Gabriel appeared and spoke to Zechariah. From the text, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. First, Zechariah was afraid. He was gripped with fear, terrified. Now, we ought not to be surprised. It's the same reaction seen elsewhere in Scripture, where there's an encounter with God or his message, or his messengers. Think about the disciples after the Lord stilled the storm, saying in awe and fear, even the winds and waves obey him. Or the people of Jerusalem, who on hearing Peter's Pentecost sermon, were cut to the heart. Centuries earlier, this same Gabriel had appeared to Daniel. Daniel fell down in terror at the sight. On seeing Zechariah's fear, Gabriel immediately spoke a word of comfort. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Now at this point, a question arises. When the angel brings good news of prayer answered, what prayer does he mean? Does he mean Zechariah, Zechariah and Elizabeth's prayer for a child? Does he mean Zechariah's priestly prayer just offered as the incense was burned for the blessing of his people Israel? Seems as if God has taken care of two things at once. He's addressed the sorrow of a husband and wife in a way that would bring blessing to all his people. Now, along with the declaration that Zechariah and Elizabeth would have a son, the angel Gabriel gives details about his name, his character, his spiritual formation, and his ministry. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. 
So those are four things. We'll take them one at a time. His name will be John. The name is apt because it means the Lord has been gracious. It is God's grace that's at work in the birth of all children. But these circumstances make it clear that God was at work in a special way. As to his character, John would be a man with a great heart. He would be a joy to his parents. And many would rejoice at his birth because he would be great in God's sight. He would have an inner majesty of heart and soul. Jesus described him in these terms. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Jesus puts the Baptist in the same league as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Samuel, David, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. As to his spiritual formation, Gabriel mentions two things. First, John was to have no wine. This indicates that he was to be a Nazarite, a man specially consecrated and set apart for service to God. From his birth, he would be prepared for service to God through rig rigorous spiritual discipline. Second, he would be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth, or as perhaps better translated, from the womb. We'll hear more of that when Mary comes to visit Elizabeth and John in the womb leaps for joy. And fourth, John would minister in the power of the Spirit in the footsteps of Elijah in order to prepare his people for the advent of the Lord. In the spirit and power of Elijah, Gabriel had said, echoing the last verses of the Old Testament. And so it came to be. The prophet Elijah had denounced the sinfulness of his own people. He had confronted, defeated, and destroyed the prophets of Baal in an epic encounter. God rained down fire from heaven on his behalf. Now think of John the Baptist preaching to the crowds at the Jordan River. You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. John's ministry, blunt and fiery, would change lives and prepare people to meet Jesus. So Zechariah is in the holy place. It's the greatest day of his priestly life, one never again to be repeated. The angel Gabriel shows up in answer to his prayer and tells not only of a son, but a son who in God's eyes would be great and would be the herald of the Savior, the Messiah. And in response, Zechariah says, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. He shouldn't have doubted. He knew the scriptures. They tell of divine interventions and in the birth of Isaac, Samson, and Samuel. If God had done it before, he could do it again. And more than that, he was a priest offering prayer in the temple on the most important day of his life, and he was met there by a supernatural being. What more could he want by way of proof than that? And yet he doubted. And here's why his doubt was so serious. Through his doubt, he implicitly denied God the power of resurrection. If God could not make a barren womb fruitful, how could he raise the dead, the new and everlasting life? And so Gabriel was quick to respond, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you, to tell you this good news. And now you'll be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. It's as if he were saying, you stand in the holy place once in your life. I'm Gabriel, an angel who appeared to Daniel six centuries before you were born. I stand in the very presence of God and have done so since I was created, and yet you do not believe. He struck Zechariah dumb. It may well be that he made him deaf and dumb. He'd not be able to speak for another nine months. But think of it this way. Not only was this a chastisement for his unbelief, it was another sign given to Zechariah to strengthen his faith. Because it would happen, as the angel has said, he would not be able to speak. He would have a son. He would be restored once the boy was born. Now, while Zechariah was inside the temple, the worshipers outside were starting to wonder what had happened. The usual practice was for the priest to complete the incense burning quickly, because the holy place was not a safe place to be. God is holy, mighty, and righteous, and he's not to be dealt with casually, but reverently and fearfully. It's proper that we tremble in his presence and at his word. When Zechariah didn't come out, he was supposed to pronounce the ironic blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. But he couldn't speak. And so the people then knew something had happened. He'd seen a vision and that the long silence of their God had come to an end. Now that's wonderful, isn't it? God's long silence is broken by good tidings. There will come one 
who will prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. Hearts will change, lives will be transformed, the disobedient will repent and seek the wisdom of righteousness. But there's even greater news to come, for one greater than John the Baptist stands just beyond the horizon, ready to make way to Bethlehem to be born. And there he was born, he grew up in Nazareth, he ministered in the town and villages of Galilee and made his way to Jerusalem and across. And there he was crucified for the sins of his people. And there he rose from the dead, breaking the power of canceled sin. Forty days later, he ascended to heaven. But in doing so, he did not leave us desolate, for he sent the Holy Spirit of God to live in the hearts of those he had loved from the beginning, even before they were born. And because he lives, those who trust him can say with joy and full assurance, we shall live also. Can you say that? Can you say with sound re reason, I shall live also? Make sure you can in the only way that God has provided. Trust in the Lord Jesus alone. Say to him, Lord Jesus, I'm a poor sinner. I cannot do what you command. My heart is dead in trespasses and sins. But here I am anyway. I've come to you for a new heart. I've come to you for cleansing. I've come to you for a true righteousness. I need the goodness only you can provide. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Pray that prayer sincerely from the heart. Those who go to the Lord in that way will be received in mercy and made new. They will have something to sing about this Advent season and throughout all eternity. In Christ's name, amen. We'll close with our uh, final hymn, 214. And now with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost rest and abide with you this day and always. Amen.